want to thank uh, I want to thank everybody for coming this morning. Um, unlike most things in the Senate, we'll try to start on time and uh, and end on time. Um, really appreciate the uh, participants and. For those of you in the uh, sort of listening audience, uh, for what it's worth, uh, we constantly have people in our conference room uh, in Washington espousing different views about uh, energy in the Tennessee Valley. And obviously, all of us uh, care a great deal about job creation, not just job creation today uh, while we have 9.1 percent unemployment, but job creation in the Valley throughout Tennessee over the next uh, 20, 30, 40 years. And so we all know that electricity rates uh, are a big driver of that. You know, we have tremendous work ethic. We have tremendous location here in Tennessee as it relates to getting to lots of consumers in the United States. It's one of the best locations in America. Obviously, our state has a tremendous environment. Thanks to folks like Bo Watson, who's here, and Tim Boyd, who's here, who's here, Manny Rico, and others who help ensure that we have a, a great environment for job creation. But over time, one of the big drivers uh, is, is energy prices. I mean, that's what, especially on the manufacturing side, is a major driver as to whether people locate in the valley or stay in the valley and actually expand their operations. So as I mentioned, um, a lot of the folks that are here at this round table, which you know, I so appreciate uh, them being involved in this, represent folks who are in and out of our office constantly concerned about where energy prices are going, concerned about uh, what we're doing as it relates to try, trying to retain, retain uh, companies in the valley. And most of the folks here uh, we have a long-time relationship with, they're friends. This is today not about uh, some gotcha type of meeting. This is just a meeting to talk about where we are and to air some of the concerns that we have. And, you know, first of all, to examine um, where are we as it relates to electricity prices here in the valley relative to other parts of, of the country. Where are we? Where are we going to be in the future? I know there's been a, with TVA, there's been an EPA settlement. There are additional EPA regulations that are coming down the pike that all utilities all energy producers are going to have to deal with. And while we're on that note, I do want you to know that we tried to get EPA to have a representative here uh, just to tell you some of the frustrations that no matter what level uh, you're involved in, uh, we not only uh, did not, were not successful in getting an EPA, EPA representative here, they never even responded to the request. So some of the frustrations that not only companies uh, in the Valley deal with, uh, but also elected officials. And then we want to look at some of the things that are going to happen down the pike, some of the flexibilities that might be helpful, especially for TVA, in meeting some of the demands that they're going to have. And then what can we do at the federal level to actually deal with some of the things that may be coming down the pike? What can we do to ensure that we continue to be a place of great job creation? I cannot imagine a better place to have this than in Chattanooga. Chattanooga is a city that certainly has embraced the future. I thank all of you for being here. And with that, without me uh, monopolizing the time, I'd like for each person who's participating in this roundtable to introduce themselves, say who they represent, and, uh, and then let's uh, and go ahead, if you would, and just give a little bit of your point of view as to where we are. And we'll start with you, Paul Bailey. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. I'm pleased to be in Chattanooga. I think I told you the last time I was here was a long, long time ago, so it's good to be back. Um, I would offer a caveat initially. Well, first of all, ACE represents utilities who burn coal. It represents coal producers, and it represents railroads because they haul coal. We have Caterpillar and some equipment manufacturers mixed in also. So what brings this group together is the use of electricity to generate, the use of coal to generate electricity. Um, the caveat is that uh, the firm that did the modeling for us was not available today. Uh, we had six economists who worked uh, on the study. Uh, I am an ex-engineer, not an economist, but I'm familiar enough with the numbers, I think, to address those today. We did two rounds of modeling. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I think I can summarize it pretty well for you. 
We did two rounds of modeling. Uh, the first one we call NERA 1.0. Uh, we just invented that name, and we modeled two regulations. They were both uh, EPA proposed regulations at that time. This was started about a year ago. Um, There's a lot of concern in EPA uh, in Washington, sorry, about something called EPA train wreck, uh, and it's a long list of EPA regulations uh, that are going to be adopted over the next uh, year or two. And the concern was about the impact of all those when you sum up. Uh, the impacts on, for example, a coal fuel electric generation in the electric sector. So our board asked us to model two of the regulations. Uh, I was surprised at the size of the numbers. We tried very hard uh, to go out of our way not to exaggerate the impacts of this. Some studies in the past have used worst case assumptions, sometimes by default. But we used DOE's energy forecast, we used EPA's, a lot of EPA's assumptions, we used a lot of EPA's cost numbers. Uh, we knew we'd be accused of cooking the books, so that's why we tried so hard not to cook the books with this study. Second study we did uh, were four EPA regulations. Uh, there are more regulations than that that comprise the train wreck, but we looked at four regulations. And I'll repeat a few of the numbers for you, Senator, and then we can move on to other speakers. Uh, in terms of the overall cost, we really looked at electricity prices, we looked at uh, increase in the cost of natural gas, we looked at coal retirements, we looked at jobs. So overall the study looked at the electric sector and also looked at some of the macroeconomic impacts like employment. Uh, we don't think there's another study that looked at the net impacts uh, of all these regulations, for example, on jobs. But I'll quote you some numbers both at the national level and the way the model works that NERA used. This is broken down by region. So we cannot tell you what the impact is going to be on a particular state, but we can tell you in certain regions. Uh, in, in the case of Tennessee, Tennessee is part of a two-state region, Tennessee and Kentucky. So nationally, uh, we found average electricity price increases of about 6.5%. Uh, in Tennessee and Kentucky, we found average retail uh, electricity price increases of about 13.5%. That's over a nine-year period. So they're about double the national average uh, in these two states. In terms of coal retirements, and this is important because it affects natural gas prices, we found that 18% uh, of the coal capacity in the two-state region would be retired. This would be by 2015. All these regulations, the ones that we modeled, would hit by 2015 because that's just the way the law works. Uh, in terms of natural gas prices, this one surprised me a little bit. Uh, we had an increase uh, uh, for residential, commercial, and industrial consumers of natural gas of about $8 billion a year. Now, that's nationwide. Large increase in the price of natural gas. I think it's about... Uh, about 17, 18 percent increase in the price of natural gas nationwide. And the last number I would mention to you is in terms of job losses. Uh, a lot of studies, uh, when they look at job losses, this is nationwide, I'm about to quote you. Uh, some groups tend to focus on job losses, uh, environmental groups, and others tend to focus on green jobs. Uh, we looked at both. The way the model works, we looked at both. We found a large number of green jobs from this because the capital cost associated with these regulations is over $100 billion. So you sort of got a $100 billion stimulus program in effect. But the job losses outweigh the job gains by four to one. So we had uh, an, uh, a net job loss average each year of about 183000 We looked at a few states. We did not look at Kentucky or Tennessee, uh, but substantial net job losses. So I'll turn it over back to you, Senator Corker. Okay, and uh, now when you say net job losses, um, go back to the number, I guess, that NERA put out rel relative to just, let's go to the net electricity cost that is projected in Tennessee uh, by 2016 based on the data you've put together. Yeah, we did uh, some of the information uh, that we have presented to people uh, present peak year rate increases. 
Uh, in Tennessee and Kentucky, the range was a low of about 7% to a high of 19%, depending on what year. I think the one you're talking about is 2016. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Christopher? <coughs> thank you, Senator, and thank you very much for, for taking the time to actually look into this issue. It's something that you hear sort of a lot of talk about inside the Beltway, but I find it as, unfortunately, a Beltway denizen, um, all too often folks don't actually spend time delving into the issue and trying to figure out what it means. Um, I work at uh, the Institute for 21st Century Energy at the, uh, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is the largest business federation in the world representing the interests of more than three million um, businesses of every size, sector, and, uh, and region. I'm waiting for my slides to pop up here. Apparently I'm the only one who brought slides, but I'll make sure it's worth your while. Um, I'm going to give you, my intention is to give you a little bit of a, a broader overview of what we um, have characterized as a, a regulatory overreach, ooh, we got some bad, uh, um, regulatory overreach to say the least. Um, as a general principle, every percent of GDP growth requires about three-tenths of a percent growth in energy um, use. Um, it's sort of a chicken or egg thing, but they go together hand in hand, and we just saw this morning um, report that GDP grew by about 2.5% last quarter, which is a great sign. And I say this because we expect as the economy continues to grow, we're going to need a lot more energy, um, specifically electricity. And if you look at what the EIA has projected, as much as a 44% growth in electricity demand between now and 2035, and more than 30% in the southeast alone. Um, which is to say that in spite of recent economic trends where um, consumption of everything, including electricity, has been generally down until very recently, um, we still expect to see large, large growth. And if you are a utility, I'm not going to put words in your next speaker's mouth, but you see these projections, you know that you're going to need new generation. And that's a very difficult proposition right now, knowing where to invest literally tens of billions of dollars um, in order to ensure the longevity of those investments by ensuring they're going to make it through every single hoop that is being put up before them right now. Um, in a broader sense, this isn't just EPA, um, more than 6,000 rules were proposed and finalized last year alone requiring more than a trillion dollars in compliance costs. <coughs> and you can't see it down there on the bottom, but it says right now there's, according to the government, according to the administration itself, there's over 4,200 regulations in the pipeline, um, which is to say that 6,000 was large, but that's not the end of it. And these are in all portions of the economy. And so while we're focusing here on electricity and on, on energy, it's important to realize that energy firms also have to comply with all these other regulations, but so does everybody else. So do the energy consumers, whether we're talking about health care, whether we're talking about Dodd-Frank financial reform. Um, as these rules are being promulgated as a business person, whether you're the largest business in the free world or whether you're a sole proprietor, you're not sure where to put your capital, which is exactly why we see in excess of $2 trillion of, of, of spare capital sitting on the sidelines now. Um, to get back to the electricity side, this is where, as a country, we've built out the type of generation we've built out over the last 15 years. Um, you'll see that in the last five years, it started to decrease quite a bit, and in the last two or three years, the vast majority of that has been in renewable, um, renewable build-outs. Um, I put this only up here as context as to where our sort of generation map has been going. Now, I mentioned before, if I'm a utility board uh, member or a CEO and I'm sitting here looking at these massive growth projections and trying to figure out what am I going to build? You know, it's going to cost me maybe upwards of $8 billion for a nuclear plant, maybe, you know, a billion for a, for a combined cycle um, a coal plant or, or natural gas plant. Well, these are the hoops that I'm forced to contend with. This is the depiction of the EPA overreach. Um, over, you know, starting in, in mid-2009, these are the, the proposed rules um, in a pictorial sense that I, as any covered entity, um, whether it's a utility or whether it's a refiner, but especially in this case a utility, I have to make sure that any investment I make is going to clear every single one of these hurdles. And because they're all being promulgated at the same time simultaneously, it's almost, 
it's very difficult for me to have any degree of certainty that my investment is going to clear every single one of those. And I run the risk that if it doesn't, I just made a $2 billion or more dollar investment that now I'm going to have to go in and invest more in order to you know, put new emissions controls or um, uh, some, some new sort of technology to ensure that my investment can keep going. And I'll just make, make one other general point. Um, we talk about rates and, and we can project what rates are going to be based on the, the EPA regulations. But it's, I think it's important to understand that the rates, the absolute rates themselves aren't necessarily um, the only part of the story. The other part of it is the certainty of those rates. I mean, it's one thing to say that you're going to pay 20% more, but if you know with absolute certainty it's going to be 20% more, if you are a heavy industrial consumer of energy, you don't like that, but at least you know what your costs are going to be going forward. Right now, there's, the only certainty is that they're going to go up. But because we sort of have this whack-a-mole process where, okay, we're going to propose this rule, but now we're going to backtrack it, and maybe we'll do it again next year, as we've seen with ozone, or in two years, and now we have uh, the, 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 the cross-state air, air pollution rule now sort of in, in a little bit of uh, purgatory, it, it provides no certainty whatsoever on the rates or on the compliance. And then just one last thing on reliability, um, something that we've taken uh, to heart, um, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, who oversees the, the wholesale or the bulk power markets, um, in response to uh, questions from Senator Murkowski, suggested that on sort of back of the envelope calculations, that the EPA rules, as they were sort of envisioned at the time they did this, would necessitate or would, would result in 81 gigawatts of coal likely, or 40 of it was likely, 41 was very likely, being retired early. Now, obviously, every generation facility in the country is going to retire. It may be 80 years from now, it may be tomorrow. But the point here is that they will be retired early, meaning that the effective life of the plant will not be utilized. Um, as you well know, in sort of response to Senator Murkowski's follow-up, Chairman Wellinghoff of FERC has said, we have no intention of actually looking at, um, looking into this further trying to back our numbers up and do a full analytic analysis. And the chamber has taken issue with that and finds it a very serious um, uh, ig ignoring of FERC's role in ensuring the, the reliability of the bulk power market. And we have called on um, Congress to ensure that they, they do their job, because right now they're completely ignoring that. And whether it's for political or other reasons, the point is, is that that's one, that's one of the primary roles they have in life, and right now they're not doing that. Christopher, thank you, and Tom for the man who's managed through all those boxes. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, my name's Tom Kilgore, and I'm the CEO of TVA. I've been for about five years, and I'd just like to say I know the storms are making the news again this morning, and to all of those people, especially people like Harold who had to contend with that along with us, uh, that was uh, remarkable to get recovery from that, and so we're proud of our employees out there. Let me talk a little bit about energy in general and regulations and uh, electricity prices. Obviously, that's a concern to us. One of the things I'd say about regulations, I think it was Mamie Eisenhower that told Dwight he didn't get to deal the cards, he just had to play them. And so that's what we're, this illustration is really what we have to contend with. And uh, I could have brought the train wreck slide, but he did even better for me. And we have a myriad of those. Uh, the DOE requirement that we pay millions of dollars into a spent fuel storage for nuclear that that makes zero sense. results. I mean, absolutely <laughs> zero. That's just, uh, that's just untenable. Uh, so there are many things, but I think we're, we're going to focus on environmental this morning. So let me tell you that TVA's you, made You a can lot focus of on whatever you want to. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so those are, I mean, that is a, it's a cost. It's built into our rates. It's there. We have to pay it. Uh, Harold has to pay me. I have to pay DOE. It doesn't stay at TVA. Uh, so that's that's very uh, egregious. I use that word, and some folks uh, cautioned me on that. I said, "No, that's what it is." But uh, 
The environmental regulations, I, I am proud of the fact that we've cleaned up about 90 percent of the sulfur oxides and about 86 percent of the nitrogen oxides, and so that's good for the valley. So I'm going to make one statement that I'll make now and then I'll repeat later. It's not always the end result of the regulations, it's how they're put in. Uh, most of the time we spend more time talking and debating the regulations than we are allowed to implement them when we get finished. We actually will spend five years talking about them with EPA and everybody proposing. and we, we debate them and then we get three years. So everybody on this side at least knows we've got to do major things by 2015. We're given about three years to do something that's been debated for five. That, that's untenable also. But so what are we doing to play the cards? We've got a vision and our vision is to be one of the low cost, cleaner energy suppliers in the nation. And we have cleaner there because we think clean is, is good. You know, there's a, a limit to that and there's a balance in that, but we don't uh, rail against the end proposal. It's how we get there. Low cost. Uh, our rates have gone up, uh, you know, but our goal is to regain our top quartile position and we have a plan to get there. So one of the things we've done is do an integrated resource plan. Lloyd was on our stakeholders group and we appreciate that. Part of that is that because uh, the environmental regulations are what they are, coal has to decrease and we've even announced that we're retiring. Our number is not quite as uh, much. We're retiring about 8% of our coal fleet. Um, and we're going to depend more on nuclear, more on gas, and more on energy efficiency. And Harold's got a program going here in Chattanooga that's really going to help us with energy management. And that really makes a difference because of every dollar we spend for investment, we only use about 65 percent of that to actually produce electricity because it goes down at night. So managing how we use it is important too. So we have a, a vision, we have a plan, and so what are my concerns? Um, well, let me talk about highlights and hard spots. The, the good point is that the Valley is still an attractive place to be. We're attracting in our economic development, we're attracting jobs, we're glad to see those. And uh, some people are attracted because we are cleaner than we, we have been. So that's good. We're attracting solar investments and things like that. My concerns are principally about the time to manage through all of this maze of regulation that we've got. If we had, if we could make some gradual improvements every year as opposed to having 2015 as a deadline when you've got to have all your coal plants comply to this particular regulation, it would be a lot easier. It would be a lot easier on our rate pressures and everything else. So as I said before, it's not the end objective all the time. It's the time we have to get there. And the time is important because we're a capital intensive uh, business. Uh, the numbers are that everybody's going to have to spend in the United States about $80 billion a year to do these things that we need to do. And so if we could do them from 2015 to 2020, that's much better than having to comply all by 2015. So. That's, uh, that's my hardest spot is that time. But we do have a plan. We still are, you know, our rates are about 40 to 42nd in the nation as far as where we rank. We have a plan to get back to the 25th percentile in that top quartile. Thank you very much. Harold? Thank you, Senator. Uh, I'm Harold DePriest. I'm here representing EPB uh, and the uh, Tennessee Valley Public Power Association. We're the distributors who distribute TVA power. Uh, it's obvious to all of us that electric rates are going to be going up. I think it's worthwhile to just, uh, as a common sense thing, to think about what's going to be driving them. And to me, there are really three things. Uh, one is simply we're going to be seeing and are seeing global competition for, you know, for fuel. And as the global economy comes back, the, the fact that countries like China and India are going to be electrifying their countries at a dizzying rate is going to have an impact. I can't. I can't impact that. I do think TVA's uh, generation mix says we do pretty well in that race. Uh, the other thing that's driving rates are more, of more concern to me and frankly uh, interact. One is that we have an aging utility infrastructure in this country. Uh, we just need to face the fact 
Uh, Tennessee is a good example. In 1935, only 3% of Tennessee's farms had electricity. Now, what that really means is we built the bulk of our system between the mid-30s and about 1970. That's basically the, when we put air conditioners in our homes, the last big appliance that uh, was an energy hog. And what that means is, uh, for instance, for here at, uh, at EPB, about 70% of our system was built before 1970. It's old. Now, I see that as an opportunity if we're wise enough to take advantage of it. And it's really simple. Uh, we don't need to just replace our systems in kind. We need to use a little bit of thought. We need to automate as much as we can. And we need to build as much intelligence into the new systems. We're trying to do that at EPB. But the other thing we need to understand is that we're going to win on the environmental issues just inherent in the process of replacing it. Every time Tom builds a new generator, it will be cleaner and it will be more efficient than the units he's replacing. And, and to me, one of the issues we face is the interplay of this aging infrastructure and our urge to regulate. We frequently regulate trying to bring about revolutionary change in the industry. And this is a time when evolutionary change makes much more sense. We, we often regulate without regard to its impact on the economy. And maybe in the past that was okay. But when this many Americans are without jobs, I don't think we want to see that additional drain on the economy to, to gain a small benefit when a little bit of patience says we're going to get there as we replace the infrastructure. So I, I guess my uh, concern this morning would be that we try to, uh, we're all environmentalists, we all believe in where we're going, but let's try to pace what we're doing and not force change that we're going to get anyway for free. Thank you very much. Tim? Uh, my name is Tim Spires. I'm the uh, President and CEO of the Chattanooga Regional Manufacturers Association. And I thank everybody for coming this morning, my fellow panel members. Um, we represent manufacturers, as you can imagine, and we represent most everyone sitting at this table also as members of our association. Uh, we're the oldest uh, local manufacturing association in the nation from our association grew things such as the National Association of Manufacturers. And so, We've been at this for a while. Um, our concern, as you can imagine, as you said earlier, Senator, is jobs. Uh, in 2010, 2009, there were about 298,000 manufacturing jobs in Tennessee. That number is down from well above 300,000 a few years ago. And a lot of things have affected that, economy, environment, um, energy, and all. Um, in this, in 2009, um, we were about $35 billion of output in the state in manufacturing with an average annual wage for a manufacturer of almost $62,000 compared to the other, other an annual wages of somewhere around $38,000. Um, if you look at manufacturing in general, our gross domestic product in the United States would be somewhere around number six or seven in the world in what we do. We're about 11.5% of what comes out of Tennessee. Um, these numbers are important to us because, again, in 07, there were 6,750 or so manufacturers, and we know personally as we deal with our members, a lot of those are not here anymore. Um, and some of the things have been talked about by the other panel members, uh, environmental regulations, things that are there that um, are pushed through that are bad for business necessarily, not that uh, we are against environmental things. As Harold said, we're all environmentalists. We want to do the best we can in that. But those have been a big effect. Um, we focus on a lot of things in our organization, education, workforce development, environment, and energy. And energy is critical to our members. Um, we have members that their overall costs of output sometimes can be up to 50 percent of that can be energy. And we're involved in everything in energy, not only electricity, natural gas, utilities like water, all of those, and working to help our members make sure they're doing the best we can. Um, we appreciate what TVA has done, the reliability that are there, uh, the work they did back during the storms to get things back as, as quick as they did, you know, was a great job as well as, you know, EPB and other distributors also across the valley. 
but reliable, cost-efficient energy is critical in decisions that are made for folks if they're going to grow an existing facility, um, if they're going to move that facility to another location in the south or somewhere overseas or wherever it might be, and this is a critical part of the component when they go to calculate that. So, you know, we want to do whatever we can to work with everyone to see that we can do the best in these prices uh, to help our members maintain their strength. And the bottom line is to get those job numbers back up well over 300,000 in manufacturing in Tennessee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lloyd. And, and as we move to the two of you, we have obviously, uh, uh, you know, heavy users in our office all the time with lots of, of issues. And, and we made a commitment to folks who represent you and to you individually that we'd have a roundtable meeting to talk about this. So, so I'm glad you're here, and I hope that we'll spur some conversation here back and forth after the two of you uh, make your presentation. Okay. Well, thank you, Senator. And, and I think it, it, we, we at Owen want to thank you in particular for arranging this roundtable. I think the timing is appropriate given the challenges that we face in the energy arena today. My name is Lloyd Webb, and I'm the Director of Energy Procurement for Olin Chloralkali Products. Olin is a leading North American producer of bulk chlorine, caustic soda, bleach, and other chemicals. Our division headquarters is located in Cleveland, Tennessee, and we have 10 North American manufacturing locations, one of which is located in Charleston, Tennessee. Chlorine chemistry is essential to everyday life. The products of chlorine chemistry make possible clean water and safe foods, pharmaceuticals, medical equipment, construction materials, computers, electronics, automobiles, clothing, sporting equipment, agricultural products, and much more. Olin is a long-standing and significant member of Tennessee's business community. For approximately 50 years, the Olin plant in Charleston has been a significant economic growth driver in the state, attracting and supporting further job growth and investment in Tennessee. Today, nearly 1,000 jobs are tied to Olin's Charleston operations, including 350 plant and corporate employees. Olin is currently investing $160 million to install new technology at the Charleston facility. This should solidify the plant's role in the economic prosperity and continued development of the region for years to come. The chloralkali industry is very energy intensive. Basically what you're talking about is taking salt, putting it in a solution, hitting it with a lot of electricity, and separating that salt into the chlorine and into the caustic. So when you're looking at electricity, you're looking at a primary raw material. It is an essential raw material for us uh, in our processes, and it represents well in excess of 50% of our manufacturing cost. To compete in the chloralkali industry, we need competitive electricity rates. And, and when I say compete, I'm not talking about uh, southeast U.S., I'm not talking about U.S. The chloralkali market is a global market, and so for us to compete, we need competitive electricity rates, not just with other utilities in the U.S., but we're also talking about competitive electricity rates with Chinese production as well. We locate in the Tennessee Valley because of the reliable supply of electricity and low electricity rates, rates provided by the TVA. And as Tim said, I don't think uh, we, we tend in, the, in these sessions to talk about cost, and we sometimes kind of skim over the reliability part of the equation, but the reliability part of the equation is essential to industry. If we don't have a reliable supply of electricity, we're probably not going to locate where uh, uh, where there isn't a reliable supply of electricity. And we command TVA on maintaining a reliable electricity system. Now, however, TVA's industrial rates, which were once the lowest in the country, are no longer competitive with industri industrial electricity rates in many parts of the country. Uh, we we uh, subscribe to services that provide us with comparative rate data and Although our data doesn't align totally with Tom's, uh, I think uh, we can't argue with, with Tom's observations in, in terms of how the rates at TVA have changed over the years. So, uh, The ongoing increase in electricity rates were the biggest hurdle in our making our decision to invest new capital in the Charleston facility with respect to energy. 
we were able to justify the $160 million investment only because the new technology that we're installing at that facility realizes significant improvements in energy efficiency. And we feel it's important today to recognize that TVA also understands the rate challenge, and I think it's clear from Tom's comments, and I think everybody understands that, that they do understand that there is an issue here and an issue that needs to be, direct, needs to be addressed. And Tom and his folks are working hard to, to do the things to help us remain competitive, but obviously there are a lot of pressures that they're facing that push them in the, in the wrong direction. Uh, TVA has worked with the industrials to establish new rate programs and provide other products to support economic development in the valley. Its focus on developing effective energy efficiency and demand response programs is encouraging. And some of the preliminary results that we see rate, have seen in the last six months or so are very promising. Uh, I commend Tom in bringing in uh, a gentleman, Bob Belzar, who is recognized as one of the uh, global leaders in terms of implement, designing and implementing energy efficiency and demand response programs, and I think Bob has, has done a lot to, to build that program out. Uh, you know, it's good to see companies like Vacher and Volkswagen build new facilities here despite the electricity cost challenge. We're concerned, however, that if the TVA's rates continue on their present path, future industry will find the area less attractive and current industry will remain under threat. We encourage the TVA to adopt an aggressive strategy to develop rates and products that will keep our area competitive as we look to retain and attract well-paid jobs. All of us who work, uh, work for Olin in Tennessee are delighted to be located here. This is, this, the quality of life in this area is great and it's a wonderful place for us and our families. It's also a region that holds great promise for rapid economic development and growth, but it requires leading infrastructure and services. We're committed as an industry, we're, we're committed to continuing to work with Tom and his folks on realizing, uh, uh, realizing the objective of having a, a, uh, an infrastructure and services in place in terms of energy supply that will support that growth that we're talking about. Thank you again for the opportunity to share our thoughts with you today. Thank you, Mike. Michael. Thank you. Good morning, Senator. Uh, my name is Michael Padgett, and I'm Vice President of Energy and Carbon Strategy in Alcoa's Energy Group. And uh, I, I promised that I didn't read anyone else's uh, presentations or thoughts before I started, but you're going to hear some of the same themes coming through. I'm delighted to be here because energy, and in particular electricity, its uh, availability, reliability, and pricing are uh, key topics for Alcoa and something we're very interested in. Um, Alcoa is one of the largest consumers of electricity in the United States, and at uh, full capacity, our domestic consumption would be approximately 3,000 megawatts. A vast majority of this consumption is, is uh, at our aluminum smelters where we produce primary aluminum. And while smelters are large consumers of electricity, uh, they also produce tremendous economic benefits for the communities where they're located. Uh, in 2007, we commissioned an economic impact study for the Tennessee smelter just outside of Knoxville, and this year we've uh, commissioned two separate studies for our Mount Holly smelter outside of Charleston, South Carolina. And all three studies show that the annual economic benefit for those regional communities is nearly a billion dollars. Um, due to the nature of the process, electricity is so important to aluminum smelters that uh, we also view it not as a conversion cost, like a lot of industries would, but as a key industrial raw material. Uh, and it can be as much as 40 percent of the final cost of the product. In uh, 2010, which is the la latest year we have full data, the average power tariff for smelters in the United States was $35 a megawatt hour. And it was slightly less uh, in the world. And for every smelter whose cost is more than that, they're at a competitive disadvantage in the U.S. and most likely in the rest of the world. To give you an idea of you know, what those rates translate into, uh, I'm going to round slightly, but a $2 to $4 per megawatt hour increase in electricity represents a $6 to $12 million cost increase for a smelter the size of Tennessee. And because we sell on a worldwide commodity market, that's not a cost that we can pass along to our consumers, and so it's a direct hit, you know, to the bottom line. In 1980, there were 33 operating smelters in the United States. 
and currently there are nine operating and four curtailed. Uh, that's the entire industry, not just Alcoa. But you can see where the shift has occurred. Um, having said that, you know, there, we're, we're still fighting and there's still hope. Uh, we've been able to secure some long-term contracts in some places and, uh, you know, that's one of the things I'm going to continue to do as, as long as I have this role uh, for the other locations. And I'm going to switch a little bit from the aluminum industry and talk about, you know, some of the challenges that we see facing our suppliers. Um, so TVA, and as well as a lot of other utilities, they face a number of issues from integration of renewable energy, transmission issues, and the maintenance of aging fleets. But one of the things that we see uh, coming down the road is this, this plethora of EPA rules and regulations. And I'm not going to go into them because others have shown far better than I, you know, the things that are out there. But I guess, you know, by way of example, what I think the industry face is, is kind of an unknown. How do you, uh, you know, adjust to some of the rules that are coming earlier when you don't know what's going to, what impacts the later rules are going to have? And, uh, you know, TBA might choose, hypothetically, to retrofit a certain unit with, uh, you know, equipment to comply with CSAPR. Uh, but then, you know, a few years later, there's another rule coming in place that requires more spending so that the cumulative spend is going to render that unit uneconomical. So that's, that's a problem we see facing, you know, the industry, and of course that gets passed through uh, to us as customers. I guess in summary, you know, what I would really like to say is that uh, I think, you know, there's a, there's a point of balance, and, uh, you know, Alcoa has done a lot in the EHS, uh, EH&S, world to try and improve our, our operations, uh, but there's a balancing point on how uh, these rules and regulations from EPA should be promulgated and applied, and I think others have touched on it as far as, you know, timing and certainty and, and things of that nature. Thank you very much. Well, thank all of you, and, and uh, now I'd like to sort of open it up for a little bit uh, wider ranging discussion. You know, we, we had an, on the Senate floor in the last uh, couple of weeks a China currency bill that I thought was pretty ill-conceived and did not support it. And, and, uh, and yet at the same time, here in our own country, we're doing things to, to drive up energy costs that really make us non-competitive in other ways, things that we're doing to ourselves. And I really appreciated what Tom said about maybe instead of having a hard deadline of 2015, maybe phasing in the changes that need to take place. That obviously makes sense. I know with Olin, uh, we worked with you on another provision to try to ensure that as you switched over, you had that option. You ended up uh, doing things much more quickly, I think, than you originally anticipated. But let's just get right into it. Uh, Michael, at this moment in time, do you feel that with your operations in Tennessee, it sounds like y'all could use three nuclear facilities in total around the country to power your entire operations at, at the amount you're using. I think that's about uh, what you just said. But here in the Valley, here, here in Tennessee at your facilities, are we today uh, providing you with energy at, at uh, prices you feel are competitive reasonably uh, for your operations? The, um, the, currently, the, the smelter in Tennessee, unfortunately, is in a curtailed state. Could you move the mic a little closer? Thank you. Um, currently, the, uh, the smelter in Tennessee is in a curtailed state. Uh, we, we curtailed that back in early 2009 when the, uh, the aluminum price collapsed worldwide. We cur curtailed a number of facilities uh, around the world, and that was one of them. Uh, we've been working to come back to, uh, you know, to try and get a competitive rate to restart the facility, but uh, it requires a tremendous amount of working capital to do that. And uh, so far, you know, the economics uh, of the aluminum industry haven't really uh, rallied enough. Um, with the rate that we have to, to justify yeah. that. So, but what are you saying? Are you saying it's really a function of aluminum costs more than it is a, a power cost here in the area? Uh, it's it's both. They're yeah. they're on the revenue side. As I said, it's a worldwide you know commodity market, uh, and that's not nearly as strong as it was a few years ago. And then, then on the cost side, the uh, you know the rates are above the average for the U.S. that I quoted. And, and, Tom, as we talked about being 42nd and wanting to move into the 25th uh, percentile where you've been, and I've certainly seen the charts and all of that, it, w would we say that today, because of the, the things that we're having to do, the settlements that have taken place, the, the capital investment we're having to make, um, 
would we say that today we're a little bit uh, less competitive than we'd like to be, but we believe we're moving back into a place in the very near future that, that places us where we want to be? Well, absolutely, we're not where we want to be. I don't like being at 40 second or, or that range. And so we, we recognize the challenge that uh, Lloyd and Michael face because that's our challenge, first of all. You know, we have a lot of fuel, but we also have to build these units and make sure they're financially viable. We've put about $5 billion in environmental improvements over the past 20 years, and we'll have to spend about that much more. But again, it's not necessarily the total amount we have to spend. It's the speed with what we have to spend it. Mm -hmm. And TVA has a debt cap, if you will, a limit on how much we can, you know, use for our debt. And while we've got alternative measures to go finance new plants and improvements and things like that, it is going to have some costs. So the financial flexibility that we need, you know, means that I, it's slower to get where I want to go. But we've got a plan. It's going to be hard to get there because of these myriad of things we have to contend with. But uh, I think we can get back to that point. Will you be seeking flexibilities uh, as it relates to that issue soon? Absolutely. We're working on multiple fronts, including trying to go to the markets for private financing and looking at owner, you know, the uh, Herald's a part of seven states, which has, you know, customer-owned generation, if they can do that cheaper than we can or as cheaply. So we're looking at about three opportunities, really, to try to move this thing along. And as you look at moving back into the 25th percentile or whatever uh, that you consider to be a, uh, the, the appropriate grade, if you will, how long into the future do you see, do you see that uh, taking? That's, that's a multi-year journey. It's probably going to take us six to ten years to get there. We've got a plan to get there by 20, and if the economy were to pick up, we could do that faster. Uh, actually, growth, as most business people know, growth helps you spread your fixed costs. So when other jobs come to the Valley, it's good for all of our customers, frankly, because it allows us to sell some of those uh, megawatt hours that we have off-peak that, that are already available. Mm -hmm. And Harold, as you look at your competitors and other places, not competitors because you have a market that's pretty, uh, pretty well locked in, but as you look at your peers around the country, do you get a sense that the things we're doing here uh, as a distributor are appropriate and we're moving in the direction we need to go to maintain the, uh, you know, the, the manufacturing jobs that Tim alluded to? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, actually, Senator, I, I think I do like the term competitor. We don't compete on selling electricity. We compete for jobs. And uh, <laughs> we talk a lot in this country about ener energy efficiency and demand management. The demand side is really uh, what's going to work for all of us. Energy efficiency, we, we will help, and it will occur uh, regardless because every new refrigerator, every new uh, appliance is going to be more efficient than the last. The real opportunity that we have to help reduce the cost is in demand management. Uh, Tom and the folks at TVA are in a position where they're going to have to build new generation. When the economy comes back stronger, they're going to have to have more generation, obviously. Uh, to the extent that we can control demand in the Chattanooga area, we can reduce the overall cost of power in the Chattanooga area. Uh, and in the, in the end, I think the real issue is having industrial rates that work for Tim and the folks that he represents because they bring so many jobs to Chattanooga. So I think that's going to be our real challenge is, is to work on those. There is a logical path that TVA is following to get us there, but we're all going to be impatient. And when you say demand management, I, and this is an issue that maybe digresses us slightly, I've never understood uh, uh, when you're in the power business, and on one hand you're talking about growth, Mm -hmm. uh, growth will solve a lot of problems. Growth would solve a lot of problems for our country's uh, national indebtedness, right? But yes. growth solves a lot of problems. On the other hand, uh, and I think this is a good thing as a citizen, uh, we're focused on conservation efforts to use less power. If somebody could explain that to me as to how that <laughs> makes sense. In other words, you try to get your customers to use less, which I agree is a very good social end, and at the same time you're talking about growth. How do those, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but Tom continually talks to me about that. I've never understood how that equation 
uh, works for you from the standpoint of, of, of the bottom line and the investments that you're talking about? Well, it really comes down to a question of when people use energy. Uh, if you look on a hot summer day, the, uh, the amount of energy we use is fairly flat at night. About 8 o'clock in the morning it starts picking up and it hits its peak somewhere between 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So it's literally just a little hill. Demand means controlling the peak of that little hill of usage. And it means, uh, it means turning down thermostats uh, from maybe 2 o'clock until 6 o'clock in the afternoon on a summer day. And when you do that, you get better use of your facilities. The amount of energy that we all use at any given hour dictates the amount of facilities that I have to build and the amount of generation that Tom has to have. To the extent that we can level that out, the energy is cheaper and I have to have fewer facilities. So the conservation is more about evening out demand, which brings me to uh, Michael, I guess, with a smelter. The way that works is you have a you have a really high peak demand for a short amount of time. Is that is that correct or incorrect? Uh, no, no, actually, that's that's the opposite. We we function sort of as a base load demand customer with about a 99 percent load factor. So the two of them get uh, because they're really steady load factor. They should get our lowest cost because they're really steady. Uh, in fact, uh, we work with Michael to give them credit or they sell us part of their hydro generation so that we give them credit on their highest peak. But just to go back to what Harold said, there are many people, including some of Tim's uh, manufacturing folks, that use more, um, let's say, first shift versus midnight shift and things like that. But this is about our peak will be maybe 33,000, but our bottom at night will be 17,000. So that averages out, let's say, about 27. But we have to build for the 33. So we have to build 6,000 additional megawatt hours at a cost of not less than $1,000 a kilowatt, which if we can control that for every kilowatt that we can depress that peak, people will use the energy another time when we have it available. We actually have plenty of energy available off-peak. Who are some of the customers, Tom, that that drive, uh, and I apologize for thinking alcohol is one of those, that drive the high-peak demand that we're having difficulties, uh, uh, if you will, with our, with our competitive rates? Well, rather, I won't talk about specific names, but we have some uh, customers that just operate one shift, and if we can get them properly incented, so it's a win-win proposal. If our prices really reward them for moving their shift work two hours in some cases, four hours in others, that would help our energy di distribution, as Harold was talking about. But we have some good stories there. We have, and I'll call Echo Chemical in Mississippi, they're able to just cut their load. They're a pretty steady load, but for the right incentive price, they're willing to cut hundreds of megawatts on a moment's notice to give back to us to serve other people. Michael can't do that, and Lloyd can't do that. That interrupts their process. So we have some folks that can do that. That's really good. We try to make that a win-win thing, but it benefits everybody when we do that. Could I address that, Senator? Sure. Uh, the who is us. It's driven as much by residential customers and by commercial businesses. It's basically driven by heating and cooling air. Uh, and there are industries that are that don't work around the clock and that's pretty obvious and there are also rates in place right now that are incenting those businesses to change their usage patterns and that will happen much much quicker than you and I will change what we do in our homes but the homes are, are the big driver in terms of driving that peak in the summer and winter and you're de you're developing a system I know to, to yes, manage sir. that more efficiently that's you want to talk just a minute about that? Well, uh, what we're trying to do is to uh, work with our customers. We, we think there are two things. One is we think people need to know when they're using electricity, and they don't today. We come around, read your meter once every 30 days. So in effect, you, you get a bill that tells you what happened up to 30 days ago. Uh, we're working on a system that will allow our customers to see their energy usage every 15 minutes. And frankly, we're not going to talk to them in terms of kilowatt hours. We're going to talk to them in terms of dollars and cents. We think everybody understands that. And, and there are studies that basically say that people are more efficient in their usage when they can actually see it as it occurs. 
I don't think that will be a big, uh, a big issue. Um, I really think the bigger issue will be for us working with the people in the Chattanooga community to do things together. Uh, together, we can do things as simple as on a hot summer day, turn down the thermostats just a little bit, make our houses just a little bit less cool, and have a big impact on the amount of energy that we're drawing from TVA. It's a really simple concept. It's just very uh, complex in how you go about making it happen. But I, I think that's uh, the issue is, Senator, we need to be able to adjust our load to match our ability to generate power. And we don't do that today at all. Uh, as Tom was saying, there's a huge mismatch between the power we're using at night and the power we're using in the middle of the afternoon. And to the extent we can address that, that's almost free. Uh, now, free is a horrible word to throw out to people because they think that you actually mean it. it it's free in the sense that, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's free in the sense that once we spend the money on the systems to take advantage of it, Tom doesn't have to build additional generation to take advantage of it. So there are efficiencies out there that that we just inherently have not built into our electric systems, but we're going to be in the future. So each of you come to our office, and, and uh, you know the temperature level as we talk is slightly more elevated than it is today in this <laughs> round table uh, with people watching. Um, and I, I think that's fine, and I understand the, the and I appreciate actually the way uh, the respect is shown to, to each person here. But for, for this next segment, if we could, uh, I'd like for y'all to ask each other questions, if you would, and, and just talk a little bit about where we're going. Again, focused on rates as they are today, uh, rates as we believe they're going to be uh, down the road based on the things that, and when we look at that, I, I, look, there's a lot about the EPA piece. I, I do want to get back at the end to some federal policies that we might be able to actually achieve and work on to make all of this work a little bit better. Some of the things we know are way beyond every anybody's control. Every utility in the country is having to deal with these federal mandates that are being put in place. But if we could, let's focus on the things we can control. So where we are today, uh, energy prices where we think we're going to be down the road to continue this momentum that we have in this, in this great state. And then some of the flexibilities um, that, uh, that maybe TVA ought to have as your major wholesaler. Uh, if you all could just uh, begin those conversations uh, to each other, I'd greatly appreciate it. Senator, uh, let me start. And Really, I've got more of a question of Tom than anything else. Um, you know, as we look at these these cost pressures that TVA is under, one of the things that that I think concerns us is the unknowns that are out there. And one unknown is what the true cost of the flexible financing alternatives will be. Uh, we 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 do know that that, that TVA has a, a very good credit rating. Uh, I think most people here recognize that TVA does not get money from federal appropriations, that that money comes from debt markets or from people like us who are rate payers. Uh, and, and so, you know, one of my concerns is, and, and I guess I've concluded that flexible financing means higher costs. Recently, the Office of the Inspector General issued a report, and in that report, uh, the uh, inspector general suggested that perhaps the debt limit either needs to be increased or alternative metrics need to be put in place, such as uh, debt coverage ratio or, or metrics like that. And I want to get Tom's response on that. And again, my, my primary interest here is I, I just have a hard time believing that flexible financing doesn't translate into higher costs. Well, Lord, I certainly agree with that. We have to test the markets because it's been, you know, we've been talking about this and working on it for a couple of years now. But what we intend to do is go into the market for one com combined cycle that we that's easily packaged, and we will find investors for that very easily, and we'll find out what the marginal cost of that is. That's one option. The other option is for our customers to finance that, and they've got a program ongoing. In fact, Harold and I have meetings regularly to talk about how we could do that. And ideally, we'd like to be able to use all three of those and use the lowest cost at any, any point in time. 
but uh, I wouldn't deny at all that the flexible financing probably has a price. It's a question of how many basis points it is. If our average cost was at this point 5% or 4.5%, does that turn out to be 4.6 or 4.7 or what does it turn out to be? So we'll have some data. We're going to do one project and then we'll have real data to go back to senators and congressmen and say, look, this is really what it, the impact on the rates are. And we also have the seven states opportunity. So that is a concern uh, that we have. If we could finance these through our normal bonds and do the necessities of that, then we obviously think we'll get the lowest cost that way. Tom, I have a question. Um, and Senator Tom mentioned uh, the, uh, the debt ceiling a while ago. I do think that's a major issue. And, uh, and my question, I guess, is <clears throat> could you put it somewhat in perspective for us? <clears throat> in, in meaning, Tom, that when we look at electric rates, it's going to be driven by three things. The cost of fuel, your cost to basically produce at your operational cost, and then the cost of the capital to build the generation. Can you give us some sense of how that plays out? Yes. Um, cost of fuel is going to be about uh, 35 to 40 percent of every dollar, you know, in terms of what we do, and it's been rising a little rap more rapidly. Um, it's come back down with the price of gas coming back down. But to look back at just our cost of money, you know, several years ago, maybe 10 years ago, we were having to pay about 34 cents out of every dollar in interest cost. We've been able to get that down to where today it's about 13 cents out of every dollar. And what we liked and what the Inspector General put in their report asking us, that was our idea to put in a debt metric as opposed to a debt cap, is some debt service coverage ratio that says you can only use so much to cover principal and interest, not unlike what you'd see if you went to the bank and asked for a personal loan to do a mortgage. They'd have a cap on that, but it would be a ratio. It wouldn't be an absolute cap. So that's, that's what it's about. We're currently at about a little bit less than 25 billion of our 30 billion cap, but we always want to keep about two for cushion for things like storms and un we just won't run up to that 30 billion. So we've got some cushion, but it's not enough to see us through two nuclear units, which are going to be really cost effective for the valley and, uh, and uh, other uh, environmental improvements that we've got to make uh, to keep these coal plants running. Did that answer your question here? Yes. If I could, I want to ask Harold a question about how much do you think uh, if you did, and I know it's a guess, or I think it is, you may have better data than I think, how much do you think we could get consumers, residential folks to reduce that demand? Is it 2% or 5% or what, If with a well-instituted program? We, uh, we think we can pretty readily get to 8%. And we think that maybe as much as 16% is doable. But, and I'm talking here more, I'm talking demand, I'm not talking I know. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I want to do. But, yeah, we, we think we can do a, um, a 100 megawatt reduction uh, fairly readily. And we think we can probably get to 200 with a lot of effort, which we're going to put into it. Um, and, Senator, just to put it in perspective, uh, Alcoa's usage is two and a half times as big as Chattanooga's as the whole city. But if all of our consumers could do In fact, their national usage. Yes, sir. Yeah. The, the three yeah. three thousand megawatts. I asked Carol that and to put it in perspective, if all of our consumers could get ten percent off the peak, just off the mm -hmm. peak, that would be three billion dollars in avoided rate impact later. And right. you don't have to quit using the energy, frankly. I mean, I, Harold and I talk about this. I pre-cool my house. I cut my thermostat way up in the afternoon to 80-something degrees. But in the morning, if I want the house cool in the afternoon, I cool it when my prices, when I know TVA's prices are lower. So you can run the thermostat down at night if you want a cool house and let it run at the peak, and that way it helps it still get your house cool, but it cuts that piece off the peak. There are ways to do this. Harold's uh, got a program. I'm anxious to see how much you can get because that's going to be a model. I think. 
Tom, I have a question, and um, you know, I've been involved in energy as a direct serve customer, and then also through a distributor like Harold and, and all he represents, and you know, have, have, and use the growth credits and all that. Uh, I know as a distributor, they're much more limited in what they can do to provide incentives and so forth for economic development and all that. Um, do you see there's any possibilities of having more things move over to their side that they can do in the future in those areas? Well, we're certainly, I mean, we're constantly looking at the uh, incentives, and yes, I, I could see us actually starting to pay Harold the incentives to reduce that load, okay? Because now today we have a kind of pilot program going around. And so I could see us paying that to Harold to say, if you reduce this, here's an incentive to do that. On economic development incentives, we've gone from having incentives to have new loads into the state till now we've got incentives for retention. Uh, and I think that's working for several of our folks that we look at the jobs that are retained, the actual load factor of the industry back to is it level and steady or is it you know, kind of volatile, and if it's volatile, there's less credit because that, that doesn't help us as much. So uh, we're looking constantly at all the incentives, hours, and what we could do for Harold and others. Not a question, but just uh, a comment that I'd like to throw out as we were talking about, uh, you know, the way we interact when Generation Side with Tom and our hydros that we have up in Tennessee. One of the other things that we're doing at our smelter locations uh, around the world, but particularly in the U.S., uh, focuses all on the ancillary services, the ability to, to shift power. For example, this spring out in uh, Washington when they had the high river flows, uh, we shifted 15 to 20 megawatts from daytime high load to evening low in, in an effort to help BPA, and, and that was pretty successful. Other things that we do. Um, it can provide like an emergency demand response so that if, in fact, you know, there is an emergency and, uh, and the utility needs 200 megawatts, then we can trip a line and usually have that available within a five-minute window. And we can't keep that offline, you know, for four or five hours, but we can certainly uh, work for a couple of hours until the emergency is passed and they have a chance to adjust their system on the other side. So we're trying to be more, uh, more innovative. Uh, on the smelting system side to provide some benefits to the utilities, and that's working pretty well for us. Do we think the, uh, the mix of power that uh, TV's laid out, TVA's laid out because of the things that they are facing, are we, do we feel comfortable with uh, the longer-term plan that's been laid out? Uh, again, I have a lot of folks come into my office with concerns, and, and uh, Paul, or, as you all have looked at what's happening, are you all just... Uh, are you just laying out the facts, or are you also questioning the mix that's uh, being put in place? Well, we've laid out the facts so far. What the facts tell us about the generation mix in the country is it's influenced more by the price of natural gas right now uh, rather than anything else. There are state renewable electricity standards, there are efficiency programs and things like that. But the price of natural gas has dropped off the top of my head probably 30 percent or so just over the last couple of years if you look at DOE's projections. That's having a big increase, a big impact on how much coal is used. I mean, the nuclear plants are running pretty much flat out right now. Uh, coal was just about 50 percent of electricity generation a handful of years ago, and it's dropped a little bit every year since. And that has a lot to do with the price of natural gas, has a little bit to do with these environmental controls. But, you know, coal is roughly close to half, nuclear is 20-something is percent, gas is 20-something percent and rising right now. Um, everyone has declared themselves an environmentalist. I, I would consider myself that also. Uh, I would put rational in front of it. Uh, I've been doing this a long time, and I have questioned the science uh, behind EPA regulations before, off and on over the years. Um, we've reached a point at which we need to be even more careful about what we're getting for these dollars than we have been in the past. Uh, we did some analysis a few months ago, maybe a year ago, and we figured that we had spent uh, coal-fueled uh, generators that spent somewhere around $125 billion over the last four decades on environmental controls. 
And we calculate that these four regulations, just these four, and I really believe we have good analysis here, is slightly more over the next three years than we will spend the last four decades. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be spending this money. It just makes you question what we're getting for it. One of the regulations in particular has to do with reducing something called hazardous air pollutants. Now, that, why would anybody not want to do that? And we've taken a look at the case EPA's laid out for this. And I'm an analyst at heart, so I'm just driven by facts, and everybody's got their own facts, <clears throat> I guess, to some extent. But we've looked at there, there are two parts of that rule. One has to do with reducing mercury emissions. Uh, who would be opposed to that? Uh, the other part of the rule has to do with emissions that are not mercury. And if you peel that rule apart, the rule EPA's numbers are $11 billion a year for that one rule. These are EPA's numbers, not, not my numbers. That's the most expensive regulation we can find going back about three or four decades. Two billion of that is to control mercury emissions. Nine billion of that is to control other emissions that even by EPA's own standards are not causing cancer and other health effects like that. So I look at those numbers and I really question that nine billion a year. That's in that's a rational environmentalist part of me. Tom, you have any comments there? Well, just the amount of money I I was just struck by the fact that he said spend in three years, which is back to my point, what we've spent in the previous three decades. I mean, I'm sorry, really, I was off by a factor of two. I'm okay. sorry, Tom. But, but still, having to spend this money to, to comply with basically two regulations, the Clean Air Transport and the MAC rule, the Maximum Available Control Technology, in three years' time is what, I mean, that has to go. Just the fact that we have to raise that money and do it that quickly affects our Productivity, you can't do that without losing some productivity. You lose the ability to raise money this fast. It, it affects a lot of things. If it could be spread over a longer period of time and, and really aim toward the most critical things, that would be a big, big step. And I know my other peers are talking, uh, you probably get visits from the Senator about, yeah. can we get three more years? Can we get two more years? Can we get, and it's just, again, untenable that we've got to do all of this in three years when we've been talking about it for five. Right. I'm sure the vendors and suppliers are loving it. Uh, well, they are, but there's not enough craftsmen really to do all this work. I mean, that's the other thing. The vendors can try to do all this, but wouldn't they rather have this spread out over a period of time and know they've got level work? And it's, it's not only the manufacturing of what they want to supply to us, but it's the craftsmen that come out of the hills of Tennessee and Alabama that we need to do this and all over this country. We need the jobs spread out over a little bit bigger period of time. Tom, on the issue of natural gas, and you know, we have this is probably the issue that we hear uh, as much about as anything, and you, you can imagine why. And you and I have actually talked about this on several occasions, but. You know, there's a tremendous supply of natural gas right now, and, and prices are low. Uh, we all have friends who've lost their shirts thinking, thinking natural gas was going to be in a different place. But then all of a sudden, you know, power producers around the country are going to be all of a sudden converting to natural gas, and at some point, uh, things will change. Uh, although, I think all of us are thrilled that there's such a a reserve of natural gas in this country, and we're finding even more of it and finding even better ways of getting to it. But what is TVA? So we're converting over to natural gas, which, to, again, makes a lot of sense today, both because of its cost but also because of the standards that EPA has put in place. Are we doing anything to hedge that? How do you all deal with that longer term when other economic dynamics uh, end up coming into play? Well, it is a worry to me because we've seen natural gas go up and fall before. I mean, we've seen it fall. We've seen it run up to, at the time, a really high price in my early career of 450, and then it fell back to 250. And now we like the four dollar price because it's been as high as 15 and 16. Right. Uh, but I'm glad it's there. It is the cheapest capacity to put in to install right now, but then the volatility of fuel is something that is, you can only hedge that through the financial markets, really. 
and as we know, all the credit default swaps and everything else get into very complex instruments that are more and more regulated also. So, um, you know, it's, it's a concern to me. It's a concern to me that if Japan were to suddenly decide they didn't want to use as much nuclear, they're going to be on the market for liquefied natural gas, and they're going to pull some capacity worldwide. And so I don't know that I believe the price of gas is as stable. And even if you hedge it, uh, that's a that's a win lose game. Somebody, ha if you hedge right. it and we win, somebody else has to lose. That's not what I would call good economics for the country. So, really, we're going to be modest. We're going to grow our natural gas, but we're not going to go head over heels. We are building nuclear because we think nuclear is a good base. It's steady. When it runs, it produces the cheapest energy out there. So we're we think a balanced portfolio is the best thing. And that, just like your financial portfolio or your financial investments, you need to be balanced. You don't need to be all in one place. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, it does. Now, as you are talking about just the regulation of, of the hedges, are y'all, have y'all satisfied yourself that you're considered a, a full end user and not subject to the same types of things that uh, financial enterprises are subject to? We have, but even that takes time and people. You can't satisfy yourself with that without hiring some people and lawyers and everybody to go look at that. So those regulations have these little additional costs that you have to go look at. So That's all going to be complex, but I don't see anything here that isn't doable. I do think uh, that we are in danger in the short run. I, I think the, the discussion from both Tim and, and Lloyd make that point. Uh, but in the long run, I, I think there is a strategy out there that moves us where we want to be. Uh, the real issue is going to be, uh, again, that we're all going to be impatient on how quick can you get it there, Tom. Is there, any, uh, is there any movement on the issue of some of the distributors actually partnering with TVA on, on certain facilities, or is that issue kind of come and gone? Uh, no, it, it's still there, uh, and uh, the, uh, the truthful answer is it remains to be seen. Tom and I have got a meeting tomorrow morning. Uh, we're uh, looking for ways to move that forward, and I think there are some real opportunities there. You think there's opportunities there? Yes, the real issue, I mean, in this alternative financing, if the distributor group can actually finance this cheaper than TVA's alternate financing, you know, they, they have ways to raise money that we don't. So what we're working on, they actually own one plant right now in Mississippi, and they have the opportunity, of course, for two or three more as we go forward. Mm -hmm. and so. If I could, Senator, the issue is that we're, we, we think we have a way to get a blended financial rate. Um, uh, quite a bit of the load in the Tennessee Valley is municipals like Chattanooga. We have the ability to issue tax-exempt uh, bonds. The cooperatives don't. And uh, what we're looking at is a mechanism that we think will allow us to get a, a blended rate with some of, some of the financing backed by that tax-exempt uh, status of the municipals. And in making that, it looks like that we do have a way of, of reducing TVA's costs, uh, which in the end is reducing all of our costs. Right, right. So let me move back to Michael just uh, just briefly. Michael, as you listen, I know that uh, obviously, you know, the facility having Alcoa is very important uh, to the region. And as you listen to what's being said right now, aluminum prices apparently uh, are not at a place where, you know, it's appropriate to to, to get that facility going in the manner that everybody in the region would like to see it going. As you listen to what's been said here about the mix and how TVA is, and I know you know these things because you all have direct conversations, but is there a sense that as we move down the road you'll be in a position uh, when aluminum prices are restored to, to be back in operation based on the, this commodity that is a big part of, of what your aluminum cost is? Uh, is there a sense that you'll be able to do that? Well, let me say first, I, I really do like the, uh, you know, the changing of the mix because as we're seeing, you know, different utilities, it's kind of a, you don't want to put all your, you know, bets on one horse, so to speak. Uh, we're going to do everything that we can, um, you know, to keep the facility where it could be restarted. And um, we still have a you know, rolling mill operation that's up and running there that was a big customer of the smelter. Um, so we're, we're hopeful. Okay. Well, listen. Let me let's move to the to just the final piece. It sounds to me like that 
that um, everybody would like to see TVA rates be lower than they are. Including me. And, and including Tom. <laughs> However, if I, as I listen to the disparate groups, it sounds to me like that uh, based on what they're having to deal with, which everybody has empathy with, especially when you look at the myriad of things that have to be dealt with. And again, remember, that's just in one area. That's only uh, on the EPA side. There are zillions of other regulations that have to be dealt with, or many, let me put it that way. So based on the mix, that based on the issues that they have to deal with, everybody at this table feels comfortable with the mix that's been put in place and feel like that TVA has the has the appropriate mix in place to really get back where it needs to be over this next day, next decade in relation, in relation to other uh, wholesalers in the country. The issue longer term obviously is going to be how we compete, as has been said by the two actual end users, how we compete with other entities around the world because this truly is a very, very global society, especially for our manufacturers. So those are issues that, that many of us doing what I do on a daily basis need to focus on. But the fact is, rates are a little higher than we'd like to see them be, TVA and the distributors are working together to try to make that better in the short term. The mix is pretty good. We like where it's going. Obviously, one of the, flexib the two flexibilities that I've heard uh, number one, giving TVA and other wholesalers the ability to, to actually have more time to put in place some of the equipment and changes that need to take place. And second, and I know that Tom's going to do a test case with one facility uh, or one operation, but my guess is he's going to be back talking to us about some flexibility on the debt coverage ratio, which is the way most businesses in this country most individuals in this country uh, have to operate. So the question is, other than focusing on those two things, uh, one right now, the other when the time is right, are there other issues at the federal level uh, that are realistic? I do want to underline that, that we need to be discussing or looking at in the very near future. I'd love to have any other input other than what's been laid out here. I'll, I'll take the bait and see if uh, see what others say. Uh, there are other EPA regulations, and by the way, I should have said this. I did not come here to beat up on EPA today. They deserve it a lot of days. Some days they're some days they try try better than other days. Uh, there are other EPA regulations. Again, I've said it before. I'll say it again. These are just four. And Tom, I apologize. I misspoke earlier. The, the numbers I was talking about. We're talking about. Let's say we've spent 100 billion in four decades. We're about to spend another 100 billion in a little less than one decade. That's what I should have said. There, there are other EPA regulations. EPA is doing all these regulations right now. We can talk about what the regulations say. They're partly stuck with this because of consent agreements and uh, rules that have gotten thrown out in court and that sort of thing. What they do with regulations is a whole different matter. But there are other regulations that will come up next year and in the following year. I would guess maybe another two, three, four regulations. Uh, I have no idea whether they will be as expensive as these regulations. EPA will shortly propose some regulations for greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, uh, I fought the climate change wars a few years ago, Senator. I know you were involved in those. That could be a very big deal also. We hope that does not go in the wrong direction. I'm not going to argue that we shouldn't do anything about climate change. That's sort of like religion when you start talking to people about that. But I would just say that there or the EPA regulations are going to be expensive. And, and to Tom's point, what I keep hearing mostly from people is not questioning the requirements themselves, the emission levels and the reductions, it's more the amount of time people have. So I, I hear the same thing from a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, coal producers, utilities, and others in that respect. Christopher, any, any comments? <laughs> as far as... Uh, what can be done at the federal level? Um, with due respect to the Congress, um, I'm not sure that there, there is anything realistic right now, unfortunately. 
and you know, while as as he discussed the, the climate wars at the last Congress, I mean, functioned as a, a great distraction to almost everyone while EPA was busy at work creating that monstrosity that I put up there, and that's going to keep going. And some of those regulations have been pulled back or delayed, but they're going to come back. And it all depends on who, frankly, the administrator is as to the, the harm or the, the effect and the impact that they're going to have. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't address a little bit your comments about natural gas before. Um, as somebody who has members from all over the country, utilities, um, I look to your situation here and I'm somewhat envious because you, you do have um, a uniqueness that many other um, wholesalers don't have. And it would, be, it, it, would, it would be in the country's best interest to be able to see other wholesalers, other merchants to be able to invest in nuclear right now because over the long run it's obviously going to be, you know, it's going to be a very cheap and reliable source. Um, because of the way most um, wholesalers are, are situated, they don't have that option right now because they're viewed in a, you know, from a Wall Street perspective over a, you know, two to five year cycle and right now on the, the wholesale level, nuclear is just not as competitive as gas is. Um, not only are the utilities gun shy about gas, but so are the heavy um, industrial users. They have the scars, as Mr. Kilgore referenced to some extent, the scars to show for the fluctuations of gas prices over the last decade. You know, four dollars one year, twelve dollars the next, and we've shed, you know, hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs because of that. Um, I, I'm here to say, much like every many other people have, that the paradigm has completely changed. Now the proof is in the pudding, and it's going to take a while for um, the users and the consumers of natural gas to fully see that the fluctuations are, um, I won't say a thing of the past, but the stability of natural gas prices are going to be constant. It, it's going to be there. And whether it's because of EPA or whether it's because of um, the cost differentials, natural gas is going to progressively become more of the mixture of our elect electricity generation, especially as the infrastructure is built out to bring some of these new shale plays um, to markets where it can mostly be used. Um, that, that's a good thing, it, but at, at the end of the day, um, we also have, as is as mentioned, international competition for other fuel commodities. I mean, at this point, we don't expect to see natural gas exported anytime soon from this country, irrespective of you know, the hyperbole about how much we have. Um, whereas coal is definitely being exported every single day. Um, you, when you see the largest coal producer in the country go from exporting, you know, a fraction of what they produce every year um, to three years later exporting the majority of it, um, that says something. And if you look, as has been said, especially in China, um, you know, even though there's been a global downturn, their demand has not dropped off at all. And so that has put upper price pressure on all forms of coal. And the only other thing I would say is that it's important to realize some of these rules will have regional coal impacts. I mean, if you look at the cross-state rule and you're looking at specifically sulfur, much like we saw in the 90s with the, the acid rain program in the Northeast, there are several utilities who have already said, okay, we'll check that box just by um, switching to marginally more expensive coal from um, the Powder River Basin, it's not more expensive, but it costs more money to get it there, um, get it to where their generation facilities are because the sulfur content is so much lower. So they can make a fuel switch. Okay, you know, in some respects, that's great. You're, you're checking an environmental box. Uh, you know, prices are going to go up, but, you know, it's debatable how much they will. But the, what's not seen there is the regional impact um, in the coal, product, pr coal producing regions in Appalachia and how that magnifies throughout the greater um, mid-Atlantic, mid southeast region. And uh, I'm not necessarily saying that, you know, any industry needs to be protected or any region should have special policies, but I think it's important to see what the impacts are as these things sort of domino down. And right now, no one's really discussing that. Yeah. No, I've, uh, in the last uh, six weeks, I visited a place in, uh, in the heart of Appalachia. And 
you know, as we talk about jobs, it is incredible in a place, in the place that I was, where, you know, most of the population is not particularly well educated and yet uh, very high paying jobs that have been there for generations. And as you mentioned, uh, the things that are occurring right now in our country are causing those jobs to go away. And in places like that, without much infrastructure or, you know, ways of getting there, I mean, most of these places are fairly mountainous and difficult to, uh, to get to, uh, that really leaves people without uh, any way of, of uh, having other kinds of jobs that, that have provided for their families for so many years. So uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's sad to see, and it is happening, and it is a direct result of policies. On the other hand, I know at the same time, uh, you know, we talk about China. Uh, you visit there, and, you know, you can't see two blocks down the road either, so I don't think we, we want to be that. But, uh, you know, keeping things in balance is, is where we need to be. Tom, any, any other comments? Oh, I think I've made my point about time too many times, maybe not enough, but uh, it's all about giving us time. I think the other thing, we haven't talked specifically about carbon. You just mentioned visibility in other parts of the world. We, I don't think we can have these international agreements drive us to do something illogical. We're back to rational here. And not knowing what's going to happen, the debate about carbon, and even the debate about renewable energy standards, uh, I just ask you to keep your eye on those. We'd really like to see the demand management get any credit that renewables get yeah. because it's, it's actually more effective, uh, yeah. at least as effective. So we'd like to see that be on an equal footing. Yeah. Well, I think we, we had some breakthroughs uh, in this last debate where conservation could make up a component of it, uh, new nuclear could make up a component of it, and my sense is, uh, for what it's worth, there will be no debate about it over the next 13 months. And uh, hopefully, if there is a standard like that that's, that's discussed in the future, mm -hmm. things like hydro and nuclear that obviously are totally clean, uh, hopefully will be a part of the mix. I, I, I don't think that, in the near term, is a, is a variable that TVA is going to be dealing with. Harold, do you have any comments as we get um, ready to move to Middle Tennessee? <laughs> <laughs> we just want everybody to move to Chattanooga and bring jobs with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. One thing that uh, we've been working, uh, TVPPA and TVA have been working on, is uh, the concept of more transparency in, in TVA's uh, long-range planning, financial and uh, uh, physical. And um, I, I'm feeling better in, in terms of seeing that Tom has a plan that, uh, to me, makes a lot of sense. Uh, TVA today has about 70 percent of its generations based on coal. And any way they go in, in the future, whether it's uh, nuclear or whether it's gas, it's going to be on a, I think, a lower cost. Uh, fuel that is less environmentally damaging. So it seems like that's a good move any way that you go. Uh, again, uh, the devil is always in the details. I, I do think the TVA has a, a lot of issues that are out there, and one of them is sort of an artificial issue that, that is still the most crucial, and it is this issue of, of financial flexibility. They have a few years, uh, I think, before it becomes an, it, extremely crucial but if we're really serious uh, in terms of getting our economy back together and getting jobs in the valley, the, the interesting thing is, is as we grow, in, in some ways it exacerbates the problem because we're going to have to have more generation to, to meet that load. Right. Uh, so I, I guess I have, uh, I'm an eternal optimist. I, I think if we handle it right, all of this can wind up being greatly to the benefit of the Valley, but it really does depend upon us doing the right thing. And other than the other federal issues that have mentioned, no, no additional federal focus? Uh, well, the biggest issue, uh, the comment I made about the uh, regulatory issues needing to be more uh, evolutionary than revolutionary goes to, to Tom's point about timing. Uh, in, in a lot of the cases, we shoot ourselves in the foot by trying to do good, but trying to do it too quickly. Right. Right. Thank you. Tim? Um, a couple of weeks ago, I participated in the advanced manufacturing partnership of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. We met in, at, down at Georgia Tech and had a real good discussion. And, you know, this group hopefully will be able to go back to Washington and share some things. And we boil it down to four things. Some of them we talked about policy and what that does and what that means. 
another one that we talked about a lot that I think we, we've hit on but not really got into is technology. Are we continuing to develop and drive technology that goes for the efficiencies, the things that, that Harold is doing with EPB and all that? That is critical to this issue. Um, a, another key component we talked about uh, that was brought up er earlier is infrastructure. And that is an issue that, that is a part of the cost that drives where we are now. But one of the things that's especially important to us, uh, Tom mentioned earlier about just having the people, right now uh, we see a really big deficit in the type of workforce that's needed to go forward in this type of work. And we, uh, there's a lot of things being done in this, but we really need to work on education for uh, moving forward with STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, from K through 12 on through, uh, when uh, they're able to start cranking up down in Alabama on the nuclear plant, there's gonna be a big pull in, in those type people down there that's gonna affect everyone. So this is also a critical part of that, what it costs for the people, what it costs to build the facilities, and the capital costs and everything. So that, that workforce pipeline is really critical moving forward also, I think. I'll be sure and mention that to Governor Haslam. All right. Yes, sir. Lloyd. Uh, Senator, there are actually three points we'd like to close on. The first one is, and we've already, I think, uh, addressed this uh, probably adequately, is putting in place competitive rates uh, that compete with not just uh, other utilities in the U.S., but uh, the cost of electricity around the world. And I do want to commend Tom. I think one thing we've seen over the last five or six years is Tom and his people have put a lot of effort in working collaboratively with the customer sets, whether the distributors or the direct serve customers like us, to engage us in putting in place rates. And I, I really want to encourage Tom to continue with that. Uh, I don't think we can get to where we want to be unless we continue to work in that, in that mode. Um, obviously, the debt ceiling is, is a huge concern with us with the near-term investments, and, and I would put Bellafon in, in that category as a near-term investment as well. So uh, we're concerned about that. And then finally, what I'd like, to, I'd like to just encourage Tom and his folks to be as aggressive as possible in managing costs. Uh, you know, I think that's a huge part of the equation. As you look at their financials, you see what they spend on O&M costs. And, and, uh, Every utility around the U.S. is being aggressive, and I would ask that TBA continue to be aggressive as well. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, two things in closing. I guess first at the federal level, um, I guess I'd like to see a focus put on any new rules and regulations around environmental uh, issues. Make sure that we don't try to uh, regulate something that has a global impact on a regional or national level, and for example, even though greenhouse gas is not, uh, you know, something that's going to be, a, you know, the very near term, uh, I don't want to see something put in place that causes carbon leakage. And what I mean by that, you know, we try to clean up an industry here in the United States, only to have the jobs go to another country or another area, and uh, the world is actually no better off. And then, uh, second, I just want to say, very much appreciate you uh, hosting this roundtable and uh, enjoyed being here and having the discussion. Well, listen, I appreciate all of you doing this. I know uh, for those in the audience, uh, these kind of hearings can be awfully dry. Um, I think today's, from my standpoint, was very good, and I leave here with two or three things that we can focus on when we get back. But this is what we do in the Senate. I mean, you have hearings and people present facts, and you try to figure out a way to take, uh, you know, disparate groups together and, and, and bring them together around some regulation that can actually, or new laws that can actually, uh, uh, cause our country to be better. I want to thank all the participants. I, I made a commitment to the heavy users and to the distributors that we would have a meeting where we sat down with TVA and talked about these things. And I appreciate you being here. I appreciate the spirit with which uh, everybody made their presentations and asked their questions. And probably, uh, uh, Tom, I'd say I, I thank you more than anybody because uh, I know that coming to a meeting like this, being a semi a federal uh, entity we made this a round table and not a hearing so that Tom was able to talk more freely and not have to have his testimony uh, uh, censored by others but uh, Tom thank you for thank you for being here thank you for what you're doing at TVA and certainly uh, the two of you have come to help us from the outside to focus on these issues we much appreciate it. I think it's been a very good hearing I think uh, um, 
I think people generally, Tom, feel good about the mix that you've put in place and obviously want to see, you know, you do everything you can to control cost. And on our end, uh, we'll do what we can do to try to create some flexibility both in time uh, and if needed down the road. I, I don't want to commit to that yet, but I want you to do the pilot. Let's see what uh, let's see what the costs are, what the basis point spreads are, and let's see what needs to happen down the road. But I thank all of you, and I really appreciate the end users focus uh, on the on the flexibility issue. It seems to me that that as much as anything is of concern to both of you, and that is the, the future financial freedom at TVA. Is that correct, Lloyd? Absolutely. Okay. Well, listen, I thank you all and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much.